The Oblates of St. Augustine was founded by Father John Melnick, formerly a member of the Order of St. Augustine and of the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei. Father John's dream was to defend and preserve the traditional Augustinian charism against the attacks from modernist bishops seeking to destroy the traditional Catholic faith and religious life. Beginning during the months in 2020, when Catholic bishops made it nearly impossible to attend Mass and receive the last rites, Father John founded the Oblates of St. Augustine to preach the traditional Catholic faith, provide the sacraments according to the traditional Roman rite, and live the traditional Augustinian religious life to merit grace for the world. Living a mendicant charism, the Oblates of St. Augustine is supported entirely by the alms of its generous benefactors. You can visit our website to learn more about how you can support this mission at www.westonmonks.org. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. October of 2009. My, freshman sem my first year of college, freshman year, my first semester. I had grown up Novus Ordo, and I was very excited to leave my house because having grown up Novus Ordo, being completely and utterly unconvinced of the faith, and having seen it so lame, having given it much thought, and having given it much of my time, I concluded there was no possible way that happiness could be through this way. I had questions, I asked questions, no one gave me any answers. I was convinced that I was completely honest in looking for my answers, which is why I, was, I came to my conclusion. If I had been dishonest and just wanted to, to leave a hard way of life, um, I would have been a little bit more resentful or something. But no, I was, I was completely honest in looking for the truth and looking for happiness. And, and having grown up Nova Sorda my whole life, I, figured, I, I concluded this, this can't possibly be it. But nevertheless, when I went to college, I had my parents were gracious enough to lend me a car. I was in Nashville. I grew up in Kansas City. Someone had found um, in my room an icon of Our Lady of Vladimir. It was the only religious article I took with me. I had intentionally left any, every crucifix at home. I had intentionally left my Bible at home because I knew I wasn't going to read it. But there was something about this icon of Our Lady of, of Vladimir that I could reject our Lord because he's a guy. And, you know, as guys fight and you know, we, we butt heads and whatnot. I could, I could reject God as Father. And one thing I found difficult to do was reject my mother. So I took this icon with me. So one of my friends found, uh, found it in my room and said, Hey, are you Catholic? And I said, Yeah. Um, I'm looking for a right to Mass. Uh, where do you go to Mass? I was like, oh, great, because I had intended to stop going to Mass. And so somehow I got co-opted into uh, being the driver for a carpool. After a few weeks, I mean, August, September, October, I decided I had enough of this. Enough of this. I wasn't wasting my Sunday evenings anymore on, on going to Mass. So I decided this like on a Friday or Saturday, and I, I figured it was too late to cancel on everybody for a Sunday. So I figured I'd just go one more time, and then, you know, after, after that Sunday, just tell all these people that I was carpooling that I'm, I'm not going anymore to find a different ride. Um, so, I, so I went for the last time that Sunday, and not very many people went. There was the, the violin player, and then uh, this girl, Juliana. And she sat in a pew. She led the way, and I sat a little distance from her in the same pew. But then she pulled down the kneeler, knelt down. We were there a little bit early before Mass. And I guess something hard was going on in her life or something, but she just had tears. She started to cry. And I was like, oh, great. I don't want to look like an idiot here just uh, sitting down, just twirling my thumbs. So let, let me just kneel down too and I guess pretend like I'm praying. So I knelt down. And it had, uh, Christ the King in Nashville has a giant crucifix, giant. And in that moment, I, I let out really my last grasp of frustration in the sense that I looked at this crucifix and said, and I asked, and I told our Lord, how is it possible that someone dying 2,000 years ago affects my life today? 
I don't get it. I've asked people for answers, but there's been no one in my life with answers. I've been looking for the answers, but there's no one to give them to me, nowhere that I can find them. At that moment, the deacon was flipping through the, the lectionary, uh, trying to find what, uh, what pages, I guess, were for the, for the readings that day at Mass. And a light of inspiration hit me. One of the criticisms I had against the Mass in high school, I noticed all my Protestant friends uh, learning a lot about their faith, learning a lot about scripture. But every time I go to mass, I, I come away almost not with nothing. But from that experience of seeing the deacon flip, flip the pages, uh, I had this light of inspiration to tell me that mass isn't supposed to be a classroom. And then I looked over at this girl that was crying still next to me, and she had a little small little magazine booklet thing called the Magnificat that had the, the daily readings in it. And I had a picture of, of this angel on it, sacred art. And again, another light of inspiration. You're not living the Catholic faith. And I, I was confused because I thought, you know, just going to mass, having good mass attendance and being a nice person throughout the week was plenty, was plenty being Catholic. You didn't need to do anything else. So I was confounded by these two, these two inspirations. One, mass isn't supposed to be a classroom. And two, I'm not living the Catholic faith. Now in this moment, our Lord could have given me a more complete answer. He could have given me everything I needed to know. He could have told me what the Mass was supposed to be. He could have told me what it means to live the Catholic faith. Nevertheless, I left that Mass determined to learn two things. One, what is the Mass supposed to be? Because obviously I wasn't, my expectations were wrong. The Mass wasn't wrong, my expectations were wrong. And then two, what does it mean to actually live the Catholic faith? Complete answers are what we expect, together with complete understanding. Why do we expect complete answers? Why do we expect complete understanding? Complete answers and complete understanding would provide us one thing that is absolutely vital, according to our estimation, for our lives. Complete answers and complete understanding gives us control. It gives us control over our lives, self-determination, the ability to end up where we want to end up. But the answers I got weren't complete, and they didn't offer me complete understanding. They presented to me a mystery. Mystery not in the sense of detective work or something that can never be or will forever remain unsolved. But mystery, because the answer contains more understanding than can be understood in one moment. Furthermore, because the answer is not just a proposition, it's not just a phrase, it's not just a sentence. The answer, ultimately to my longing, is a person. And persons are not complete answers, but mysteries. As soon as you think you know somebody, you, you realize you don't. There's a difference also between our understanding of new and novelty. New is something, uh, well, new, created, never, never before seen. But novelty, rather, <coughs> for example, is when we listen to a piece of music. And each time we listen to that piece of music, something new hits us, something different hits us. Or every time you watch an, a movie, Something, you realize something different about the plot you didn't realize before. This is what a mystery is. Any answer given by God, then, is his initiative to take your relationship with him even deeper, to begin a relationship of infinite love and infinite knowledge and understanding. One reason our Lord gives us saints and gives them certain mystical gifts is to help us in understanding certain mysteries. The cross is a mystery. And one saint given to us to help us understand this mystery is St. Francis of Assisi. Captured and jailed after having made war with Perugia, he sat in a jail cell with plenty of time for reflection, to sit there cold and hungry. He sought for knighthood he wanted to become a knight and gain his glory fighting wars for his town of Sisi. But in that time in that jail cell, when he was cold and hungry, he asked himself, 
Is knighthood, is worldly glory, truly glorious? Inspired by the Gospel of Matthew, Francis sold his father's materials because he worked in a material shop selling fabrics and gave that money to the poor, trying to sympathize, sympathize with them. However, he realized that true compassion, true intimacy, is in living the same experience as someone else. For this reason, our Lord became incarnate, to live our very life, so that he can share our life, our experiences, so he can not only know, merely intellectually, but through the same experiences of life. One of the moments this sharing of experiences really hit me, came home to me, I was discerning a community, uh, priestly, priestly fraternity, priestly fraternity of Familia Christi, and we were doing Holy Week, uh, these liturgies, uh, in their convent in Viterbo, Italy. But they were lending that convent uh, to a group of seminarians who had escaped the persecution um, by Bergoglio uh, of the Franciscans of the Immaculate. And they were living at this, in, in this convent in Viterbo. And I got to talking to, to one, Fra Francesco, about well, both of our experiences of him being persecuted in the Franciscan of the Immaculate and me being persecuted in the Apostles of the Interior Life. And there was one moment where we both just looked at each other, having explained a little bit, little pieces of our suffering that we had gone through. And we just both fell silent. We looked at each other and we both realized that we both understood. And so there wasn't any need to explain, to continue explaining what we had been through. We had just, in that sense, become friends. This is also, consequently, uh, during that time I was discerning whether to persevere in religious life or not. But the sharing of life experiences was also one of the things that um, went into much of my discernment. Why live poverty, chastity, and obedience? Because it's the way of life our Lord chose for himself. Because at the very least, what I could do with my life and living a life of poverty, chastity, and obedience, at the very least, doing my very best to, um, is to give our Lord a friend. So St. Francis met a leper. Leprosy is contagious, highly contagious. It kills your body while you're still alive. So instead of running from this leper to save his life, St. Francis kissed him. Now, this moment is important because it's a miracle. But the miracle here wasn't that St. Francis healed a leper by his kiss, like our Lord healed lepers in the gospel. Rather, it was that St. Francis embraced the cross of the leper, when St. Francis abandoned himself to that cross, that was the miracle, the miracle of conversion, the miracle of abandonment to the Father's love, the miracle of finally being satisfied with God's love alone. But what gave him the courage, the strength to live such a radical life of poverty? He revealed it the moment he had to publicly apologize before his bishop and his father for giving his father's money to the poor, the love of his heavenly father. This is the same as I explained uh, on the feast or on the, for the gospel of the transfiguration earlier in Lent. That our Lord, before beginning his public ministry, he was baptized. And our Lord spoke from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then again before his passion on Mount Tabor, this is my beloved son, listen to him. This, this is what gave our, our Lord strength to love as he loved, to love as God loves. It's simply the fact that he was loved by his father. After St. Francis embraced his new life, his new cross of poverty, he happened to find the ruins of a church near Assisi, San Damiano, in which there was a Byzantine-style icon crucifix. One day, he heard the crucifix speak. Rebuild my church, for as you can see, it is in ruin. It is our crosses that our Lord chooses as the means through which to speak to us. Why don't we hear our Lord's voice and witness his presence in our daily lives? Because we dedicate every fiber of our being to coming down from our cross, to alleviating the stress and anxiety that comes from trying to be faithful to our obligation and duties of our state in life how we would love to obey the Jews who taunted our Lord to come down from the cross. 
Later in life, St. Francis received the stigmata, the five sacred wounds our Lord received during his passion. Wounds as a consequence, wounds received because he loved his father and he loved us and, des <coughs> and desired to reveal to us the father's love for us, which is even to the love the father has for his only begotten son from eternity. Love is proven by fidelity. Fidelity is proven in trial. Trials consist of unpleasurable, uncomfortable, undesirable, and repulsive circumstances. Thus, embracing wounds from your beloved prove love. Wounds are now inseparable from love himself. We allow ourselves to be deceived by the satanic belief that love can exist without wounds. Oftentimes, young couples who have fallen romantically in love believe this. They sought romantic love precisely as the cure for their wounds, as the cure for their loneliness, as the cure for their desire to be valued and appreciated. Yet true love himself accepted wounds, was abandoned by his closest friends, and was despised and humiliated. The reason some people desire and search for romantic love is the same reason why they never truly find him. The Jews believed the peace desired by every human heart is temporal, political, corporal, something of the flesh. In the circumstance of the cross, peace would be the result of coming down and alleviating oneself from the pain and torment. Our Lord proves to us, though, that true peace comes from staying on the cross, embracing every ounce of pain, feeling every drop of blood come from your hands, your feet, and the thorns. True peace only comes from a total abandonment to the love of our Heavenly Father, like a child sleeping, protected in his father's arms. Evil tells you you're not loved. The cross tells you you are loved. Evil tells you save yourself from the cross. The cross tells you allow yourself to be saved. Evil says to you, if you, de if you don't save yourself, you're a loser, you lost. The cross tells you abandon yourself. Instead of abandoning, abandoning ourselves to the love of our Father, we look to alleviate our stress, our anxiety, our pain by seeking sinful comforts, by seeking lesser things that are still good, and by seeking personal glory and prestige, honors, and worldly comforts. Let's be honest. Our glory is not that we are loved by our Father. Our glory is whatever fake image of ourselves we've created in our minds. I recommend then that as you approach the Holy Cross to venerate the wounds embraced for love of you, that you tell our Lord, as you kiss the nail driven through his feet, what glories you prefer instead of the glory of his dying love for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.